However, you, we can do much better than that. We can look for artifacts that they left behind. Even, right. even if they are dead, you can look for industrial pollution in the atmospheres <laughs> of planets. Right. Uh, why do I bring this up? Again, to show you the conservatism of the mainstream in astronomy. And by the way, I, I shouldn't, you know, I have leadership positions. I, I was chair of the astronomy department for nine years, the longest serving chair at Harvard. And I'm the chair of the board on physics and astronomy of the national academies. You know, it's a primary uh, board. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm director of two centers at Harvard and so forth. So I, I, I do represent the community in, in various ways, but at the same time, you know, I'm a little bit disappointed by the conservatism that people have. And so let me give you an illustration of that. So the astronomy community actually is going right now through the process of defining its goals for the next decade. And there are proposals for telescopes that would cost billions of dollars and whose goal is to find evidence for oxygen mm -hmm. in the atmosphere of planets around other stars. Yes. With the idea that this would be a marker, a signature of life. Now, the problem with that is Earth didn't have much oxygen in its atmosphere for the first two billion years. Mm -hmm. Roughly half of, you know, half of its life, it didn't have much oxygen, but it had life. It had microbial life. It's not, un it's not clear yet as of yet, what the origin is for the rise in the oxygen level after two uh, billion years, about 2.4 uh, billion years ago. But we know that a planet can have life without oxygen in the atmosphere mm -hmm. because Earth did it. The second problem with this approach is that you can have oxygen from natural processes. You can break uh, water molecules and make oxygen. Right. So even if you find it, it will never tell you that for sure, life exists there. Mm -hmm. And so even with these billions of dollars, the mainstream community will never be confident right. uh, whether there is life there. Now, how can it be confident? There is actually a way. Mm -hmm. If instead of looking with the same instruments, if you look for molecules that indicate industrial pollution, <laughs> for example, CFCs, you know, that are produced by refrigerating systems yeah. or industries here on earth, that it's dilute brilliant. the ozone layer, mm -hmm. you know, you can search for that. And I wrote a paper five years ago suggesting that. Now, what's the problem? You can just tell NASA, I want to build this telescope to search for oxygen, but also for industrial pollution. Nobody would say that yeah. because it sounds like, you know, on the periphery of the field. And I ask you, why would that's hilarious? Because yeah. that's exactly. I mean, even that would just be you saying is quite brilliant. I mean, because uh, it, it's a really strong signal. And if life, if there's alien civilizations out there, then there are probably going to be many of them, and they're probably going to be more advanced than us, and they're probably going to have something like industrial pollution, which would be a much stronger signal than some basic gas which could have a lot of different explanations. So like right. something like oxygen or, I mean, I don't, it, 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 you know, uh, I mean, we could talk about signs of life on Venus and so on, but like, if you want a strong signal, it would be <laughs> pollution. I love how garbage is. <laughs> no, but the pollution, like, you have to understand, we think of pollution as a problem, yeah. but uh, on a planet that was too cold, for example, to have a uh, la comfortable life on it, you can imagine, terraforming it and putting a blanket of polluting gases such that it will be warmer. Yeah. And that would be a positive change. Yeah. So if a, an industrial or, or a technological civilization wants to terraform a planet that otherwise is, is too cold for them, they would do it. Yeah. So what's the problem of defining it as a search goal using the same technologies? The problem is that there is a taboo we are not supposed to discuss extraterrestrial intelligence. There is no funding for this subject, not much, very little. And young people, because of the bullying on Twitter, you know, all, all the social media and elsewhere, young people with talent that are curious about this, these questions do not enter this field of study. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you step on the grass, it will never grow, right? So if you don't give funding, Obviously, uh, you know, the mainstream community says, look, nothing was discovered so far. Obviously, nothing would be discovered if talented people go to other disciplines. Never, you never search for it 
uh, well enough, you will never find anything. I mean, look at gravitational wave astrophysics. It's a completely new window into the universe, pioneered by Ray Weiss at MIT. Mm -hmm. And at first it was ridiculed. And thanks to some administrators at the National Science Foundation, it received funding despite the fact that the mainstream of the astronomy community was very resistant yes. to it. And now it's considered a frontier. So all these people that I remember as a postdoc, a young postdoc, these people that bashed this field and said bad things about people, you know, said nothing will come out of it. Now they say, oh yeah, of course, you know, the, the Nobel Prize was given to the, you know, to the LIGO collaboration. Uh, of course, now they are, they, are, they are supportive of it. But my point is, if, if, if you suppress innovation early on, there are lots of missed opportunities the discovery of exoplanets is one example. You know, in 1952, there was an astronomer called uh, named uh, Otto Struve, and he wrote a paper saying, why don't we search for Jupiter-like planets close to their host star? Mm -hmm. Because if they're close enough, they would move the star back and forth and we can detect the signal. Yes. Okay? And so astronomers on time allocation committees of telescopes for 40 years argued this is not possible because we know why Jupiter resides so far from the sun. You cannot have Jupiter so close because there is this region where ice forms far from the sun and beyond that region is where Jupiter-like planets can form. Mm -hmm. There was a theory behind it which ended up being wrong by, now, by today's standards. But yes. anyway, they did not give time on telescopes to search for such systems until the first system was discovered four decades after Otto Struve's paper. Mm -hmm. And the Nobel Prize was awarded to that just a couple of years ago. Yeah. And uh, you ask yourself, okay, so you know, science still made progress. What's the problem? The problem is that this baby came out barely, you know, and, and, and there was a delay of four Long decades. Delay. So the progress was delayed. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many babies were not born because yeah. of this resistance. So there must be ideas that are as good as this one that were suppressed mm -hmm. because they were bullied, because uh, people ridiculed them, that were actually good ideas. And we these are missed opportunities, babies that were never born. Yes. And you know, I'm willing to push this frontier of the search for technologies or technological signatures of other civilizations. Because you know, when I was young, I was in the military uh, in Israel. It's obligatory to serve. And uh, there was this saying that, you know, one of the soldiers sometimes has to put his body on the barbed wire so that others can go through. Yes. And I'm willing to suffer the pain so that, you know, younger people in the future will be able to speak freely about the possibility that some of the anomalies we find in the sky yes. are due to uh, technological signatures. And it's quite obvious. This is why like like folks in the artificial intelligence space, Elon Musk and um, a few others speak about this. And they look at the long arc. They, they say like, what, you know, this kind of, you know, you can call it like first principles thinking or you can call it anything really is like, if we just zoom out from our current bickering and our current, like discussions in the what science is doing and look at the long arc of the trajectory we're headed at which questions are obviously fundamental to science right. and that should be asked and which is the space of hypotheses we should be exploring and like exoplanets is a really good example of one that was like an obvious one i, I recently talked to sarah seeger and it was very taboo when she was starting out to That's work right. on exoplanet and that was even in the 90s yeah and uh like it's obvious should not be a taboo subject. And to me, I mean, I'm probably ignorant, but to me, exoplanets seems like it's ridiculous that that would ever be a ta taboo subject right. uh, to not fund, to not explore. That's very, but even for her, it's now taboo to say like what, you know, to, to look for industrial pollution. Right, right. It's and like, I find that ridiculous. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Can't take the next step. It's ridiculous for another reason. Yes, not because of just the scientific benefits that we might have by exploring it, but because the public cares about these questions. Yes, and the lot. public funds science. So how yes. dare the scientists yes. shy away from addressing these questions if they have the technology to do it? Mm -hmm. It's like 
saying, I don't want to look through Galileo's telescope. It's exactly the same. You have the technology to explore this question, to find the evidence, and you shy away from it. You might ask, why do people shy away from it? Yes. And perhaps it's because of the fact that there is science fiction. I, I'm not a fan of science fiction because it has an element to it that violates the laws of physics in many of the books right. and, and, and the films. Magic. I, yeah. And I cannot enjoy the, these things when I see the laws of physics violated. But who cares that, the, you know, the fact that there is science fiction? I mean, if, if you have the scientific methodology to address the same subject, I don't care that other people... Uh, you know, spoke nonsense about this subject or said things that make no sense. Who cares? You do your scientific work just like you explore the dark matter. Uh, you explore the possibility that Oumuamua is an artifact. You just look for evidence and try to deduce uh, what, what it means. Um, and I have no problem with doing that. Uh, to me, it sounds like any other scientific question that we have. And given the public's interest, we have an obligation to do that. Yes. By the way, science to me is not an occupation of the elite. It doesn't allow me to feel superior to other humans that are unable to understand the math. To me, it's a, it's a way of life. You know, if, if there is a problem in the faucet or in the pipe uh, at home, I try to figure out what the problem is. And with a plumber, we figure it out. And, you know, we look at the clues and the same thing. In science, you know, you, you look at the evidence, you try to figure out what it means. It's it's common sense mm -hmm. in a way, and uh, uh, it shouldn't be regarded as uh, something removed from the public. It should be a reflection of the public's interest. And I think it's actually a crime to resist the public. Mm -hmm. to, if the public says, I care about this, mm -hmm. and you say, no, 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 that's not sophisticated enough for me. I want to do intellectual gymnastics on anti-deceiter space. <laughs> to me, that's a crime. Yes, I 100% uh, agree.